I'm Susan McIntosh, Director of Ciencia, and it's my real pleasure to welcome you to this initial colloquium in our series this year on the theme of teaching and learning in the University of Tomorrow. Uh, the explosion and rapid evolution of new technologies for teaching and for content delivery outside of traditional classroom settings have created both pressures and opportunities to change the way we teach through a better understanding of how students learn. Today's panel discussion anticipates many of the issues related to these questions that will be explored next month in the two-day DeLang Conference, which is the centerpiece of our program this year. Ciencia oversees the conference organization, but the conference theme and content were developed by faculty fellows of the Center for Teaching Excellence and Ciencia members on the planning committee. We're excited by the lineup of major speakers and workshop and demonstration presenters that we've lined up. So we hope that you'll join us. Online registration is still open until next Monday, September 29th. We're also planning a follow-up event to the delaying in November, so stay tuned for information on that. To introduce today's colloquium and moderator, I will turn the podium over to our program committee chair, Fred Oswald. But first, let me remind you that you can follow this event on Twitter. Our social media assistant, Carolyn Adams, in the front row in orange, will be actively tweeting today, and you can do so as well at hashtag RiceCiencia, and the slide contains the relevant information. So, Fred. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Fred Oswald, professor of psychology and member of the Ciencia Programming Committee. And on behalf of Ciencia, we're very excited and grateful uh, to have a panel of faculty who've been recognized by the university as expert teachers across all our disciplines. These are people who have tirelessly invested time and effort into the art and science of their own teaching, which we will benefit from surely in terms of the wisdom they'll share with us today. Um, the panel also will surely be expressing a vast array of uh, opinions and predictions as they engage in a discussion entitled, uh, The Traditional Classroom, What Future? Um, to give you some context for the questions that will be explored today, let me paint a, a brief, a small picture of the future of digital education, uh, where this future is as imminent for us as it is hazy. The rapid development of online course and content delivery technologies, advances in web-based adaptive learning systems, and the widespread problem of device-driven distraction in the class raise the question of how useful the traditional classroom will remain in the future. As Rice rolls out its initial online courses for our students and ramps up at its MOOC initiative, in advance of, uh, of the uh, Delane Conference, this faculty panel will consider the future evolution of the traditional classroom as a physical space for learning and interaction. How might it be reconfigured or transformed? Could it, as some have predicted, become obsolete? Our moderator, Neil Lane, is a member of Scientia, a professor of physics and astronomy, a former provost at Rice University, a former director of NSF, a member of the AAAS, a strong promoter of technologies that will advance education and its priorities, and a great guy. Our panelists look like separate entities here, but there are actually three pairs here. Neil will ask each pair a question. Each pair will respond under some iPhone time pressure by me. And uh, after all three pairs respond to questions, we'll open the floor to you, the audience, uh, for some additional follow-up and Q&A. So thanks for attending today. We're all sure to learn something non-digitally here. Although uh, the presentation will be uh, webcast available on the Ciencia website, so you might refer other people to that uh, to enjoy it as well. So take it away, Neil. Thanks. Thank you, Fred. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor to moderate a, a panel of distinguished faculty such as we have today. Uh, we're going to hear about the so-called traditional classroom, whatever that is. I don't think everybody probably agrees, but we're closer than the classroom of the future, which we'll also hear about. Uh, I think uh, in the sciences, at least in physics, the classroom that I know about, the traditional classroom, was the prof lectures, uh, signs readings, uh, signs homework, occasionally works a problem, uh, uh, meets office hours from time to time and whenever it's convenient and so forth. That was sort of our experience. In fact, I actually had a lecture from a professor who wrote illegibly equations with his right hand while erasing the equations with his sleeve <laughs> with his left hand. It actually happened, partial diffie Q 
course, my wife, Johnny, also had the same professor. So I, I would have preferred a video, actually, to, to that lecture. But some profs were outstanding teachers. They were clear, they were passionate, they were inspirational. I remember those teachers and those lectures. I don't believe technology could have done that job. But today I think we will hear some examples of where technology can do other kinds of things, things that really weren't possible in the traditional classroom, like scaling up to hundreds of thousands of members of the class. Uh, we will uh, talk about the classroom of tomorrow. I don't know if we'll touch on all these things, but to me they bring to mind things like peer instruction, which came up in the early 90s. Uh, Eric Mazur at Harvard found out that was the best way for him to teach uh, inter introductory physics. Uh, we'll hear about the flipped classroom, so you look at the video beforehand, and then you come in and have a discussion, interactive kind of learning, I guess. MIT's ocean, uh, 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 open courseware is relevant, I think, to this discussion. You remember, mem may remember that it was the faculty who came to then President Chuck Vest of MIT, who sadly died a few years ago, uh, and brought to Chuck this recommendation, and he uh, is insightful. He saw an opportunity to make a big difference, and so the MIT course material goes online. And then we have the MOOCs, the Massive Open Online uh, Courses, uh, and those just name a few of these kind of initiatives. You may not know that former president of Rice, William Houston, sort of taught a class, a flipped class, in that uh, he didn't have a video for the students to watch, but he had his textbook, which he wrote, and they read and they worked problems, and all that went on in the class was the discussion, the back and forth with the students. Steve Baker actually helped uh, work in that environment. I think that flipped classroom I've said earlier is, uh, is not, will not strike people as so unusual and so new, because I think many disciplines and courses actually taught in that mode uh, a long time ago. Um, a famous early MOOC, Use, was, state, use, uh, was really Stanford's Introduction to Artificial Intelligence, which uh, came, out, it was, it came out in 2011 and attracted 160,000 online uh, students who enrolled, and that led to a not-for-profit company, Utah City, and along with Coursera and edX, they all emerged in 2012. And the New York Times said 2012 was the year of the MOOC. Some of you may have missed that, but that was none, <laughs> nonetheless. Now, related to these developments, because it has a special rice connection, is the idea of the free online textbook and Rich uh, Berenick's uh, 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 initiative uh, with that regard uh, uh, has, has, has really been a game changer in the field, I think. Many of you know about the OpenStax College. Now, Fred mentioned that the Delane Conference is going to focus on the topic, Teaching in the University of Tomorrow. I would guess the end of that important conference, with lots of very distinguished speakers, we're still not going to have a clear picture because nobody really knows what the University of Tomorrow is. But whatever it is, it's going to have classrooms, or at least it's going to have classes. And in reality, all of that is going to be impacted in one way or another by technology. Now, let, I think you heard the plan for the panel, but let me just make sure we're all on the same page here. Uh, the panelists have uh, paired up. They're forming uh, three dyads, Kathy and Carolyn. Uh, Rachel and, and Oske, and Dennis and Joe. And I'll ask a question to each dyad and invite comments from the two panelists. Uh, then our, our timekeeper will keep us uh, uh, on time so that we have plenty of time for discussion afterwards, because I think there are views out here about what the classroom really is or ought to be, and we definitely want to hear those. After all the panelists have had a chance to make their comments, then we will open it up for questions. Maybe along the way we'll have some time for some crosstalk on the panel, but we, we definitely will move to your questions and comments uh, as soon as we can. We encourage provocative comments and questions, but within Rice's standard of good taste. So, yeah, so we'll, we'll make our judgment of that as we go. So before moving to the first question, I want to briefly introduce the panelists. Kathy Matthews, and you know all these people, but okay. Uh, Kathy Matthews is a Stewart Memorial Professor of Biosciences at Rice University, has served as department chair and dean. Prize-winning teacher Kathy was in the first cadre of fellows of the Rice Center for Teaching Excellence. She taught a Rice course using the edX platform for both a flipped and fully online format, 
and is generating a MOOC series that will start in the spring. Carolyn Lavander is her partner. Carolyn, you all know, is Carlson Professor of the Humanities, Professor of English, and Vice President for Strategic Initiatives and Digital Education. And in the latter a role, she leads the digital learning endeavor at Rice which includes overseeing online curricula as well as K through 20, is it really 20? Okay, uh, digital initiatives. Uh, our second dyad, Rachel Kimbrough. Rachel is Associate Professor of Sociology with research interests and links between poverty and child health and development and is the recipient, recipient of several teaching awards at Rice. Although she actively engages in a variety of technologies in her large lecture course, she is a proponent of the profound pedagogical benefits of face-to-face -face interaction in the classroom, so we will hear that. And then Oske uh, Gurkhanli. Uh, Oske is a full-time lecturer in the Department of Psychology with research interests in language acquisitions and cognitive development. She's a recipient of several teaching grants and her project-based developmental psychology, psychology course uh, in, uh, it requires the students and the whole class to make a documentary on the selected topic. She believes in integrating various teaching methods in her course and flipping the portions of it, although she does not plan on fully giving up on traditional teaching techniques. And finally, the third dyad, bringing up the rear, so to speak, is Dennis Houston, professor of English, teaches courses in Shakespeare performance, Renaissance, modern drama, 1989, he was named Case Teacher of the Year. There's much more to say, but let me just say he is a Rice legend in the classroom. Joe Warren. Joe is a professor of computer science at Rice University, former chair. His main educational interest is in online education. He is a MOOC guy, without question, and we're going to hear about that. With colleagues, he's developed and taught a sequence of MOOCs on course, Coursera that cover fundamentals of computing. First course in this sequence called an Introduction to Interactive Programming in Python, has graduated over 25,000 students and is one of the highest rated MOOCs of all time across all disciplines. So we really have a spread of expertise and different views, and I would, with everybody's permission here, want to start off by posing the first question. So for $100,000, I put this <laughs> First question to Kathy, if you can raise it. I mean, <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. Vice President, $100,000. So the question is, how should we understand college campus learning environments more generally, given the impact that recent technological advancements have had on the traditional classroom? So it's a mouthful. Please, either order, uh, give us your comments. Thanks so much, Neil. I will keep my comments very brief. Um, I want to say most generally, I think that technology as we're going to approach it today has at its most profound created the opportunity for us to rethink our learning environments very broadly. Um, so when we think about learning environments at Rice and other universities, obviously we begin with the classroom, uh, but that's not the only space, as we all know, where learning and education happens. It happens across laboratories, libraries, um, in faculty offices, in residential commons, and other parts of campus. Because virtual space is ubiquitous and available 24-7, Classrooms of the future will inevitably span the physical spaces that I just described, but won't be constrained or exclusively the purview of any one of them. Um, so to give you a, a sense of an example of this, and you'll be hearing more about this from the faculty who have developed the MOOCs, um, but at Rice, over the last year, year and a half, we've developed a series of experiments uh, in this classroom of the future at both the uh, graduate professional master's uh, level and also the undergraduate level. And to give you a sense of what such a classroom enables, uh, Kathy Matthews's summer online biochem course had students completing assignments and, and course requirements um, from all over the place, including all over the globe. And um, my favorite place, I think, is a student who completed a final project uh, off the Champs-Élysées in Paris. So great, great place to do some good thinking. Um, if you look beyond the Rice Hedges and, and universities like Rice, uh, our peer institutions, I think you see a number of experiments ongoing uh, that capitalize on this capability I'm describing. And I'm thinking here 
of the Minerva Project in particular, which um, is an endeavor that begins with the set of capabilities I'm describing. And basically, Minerva brings faculty and students from around the globe into a collaboration of co-creating courseware that is platform-enabled and interactive seminar-based. And Steve Coslin, who is the founding dean of Minerva, and who, by the way, will actually be at the DeLang conference speaking in October, and I encourage you uh, to, take, to take him in. Uh, Steve Coslin says, in fact, that it is the modes of instruction that Minerva enables um, that is the distinctive value proposition of a Minerva education as opposed to um, other university education. So um, it's specifically the modes of instruction that create opportunities for learning unavailable, according to Steve, in the traditional classroom. I think if you look even further afield to developing nations and how universities are grappling with the high demand for education around the world, you see an emerging strategy uh, that's termed clicks rather than bricks, right? So scaling the classroom um, using digital technologies. So in some, I would say all of these suggest an emerging future where online education and on-campus instruction will blend, uh, where real-time instruction and continuous education will be probably two pillars of a comprehensive university education and classroom. I will now pass it to Kathy. So our connected world gives us lots of opportunities. One of the important things to remember is that time together is not just in the classroom. Time together can be shared online. And that's reflected in the Minerva project, but it's also reflected in the fact that things like Google Hangout are embedded in some of the online platforms uh, so that, that you have a ready-made mechanism for students to talk to one another. In the summer course to which Carolyn referred, the Google Hangout, which happened every day at 8 p.m., Monday through Friday, and there were only three misses, one student who had pre-scheduled traveled and two, two misses due to illness. Um, this was among the two or three favorite things that the students identified post-course that mattered to them. So that time together, a chance to pose questions and interact is important, but we are not constrained any longer to the classroom. In addition, we're learning more and more today about how people learn, uh, whether that's in classrooms or online. And that information can be helpful as we think about the classroom and we think about how we teach. Two examples. First, the impact of testing. Um, our own Roddy Rodiger, our, used to be our own Roddy Rodiger, who was at Rice for uh, a while, I, and his friends have written a book called Make It Stick, meaning how do you get information to stick. And they have demonstrated that regular testing is far more effective in making things stick and having, having students learn and remember than just studying. Don't get nearly as far just studying. Um, the other is that physically writing notes also enhances remembering and understanding information much more effectively than taking notes on the computer. And so as we learn how we learn, we can incorporate those things into what we do, and some of the things may be more effectively done online, and others may be more effectively done in the classroom. And so we need both both systems in order to succeed. Now, finally, resource spaces, the library, the laboratory, can be classrooms. They're important components of learning because these research and scholarship rich learning environments are distinguished from those that are simply online learning. If you just see it online, it is not the same as going into the lab and doing it or spending your time in the library researching something. And an important part of how we think into the future is how we take advantage of the flexibility and features of the online environment and connect them with the important scholarly endeavors that characterize Rice University as a research-intensive university. 
Thank you very much. So we'll move to our second dyad, uh, Rachel and Oshke. Uh, so the question, we'll make a more open-ended question. What is the classroom for you? And I guess one could ask, what would you like it to be? Okay. So I can't help but worry a little bit that universities today feel like it's time to abandon the sinking ship of the traditional classroom. But I would like to ask, what are we talking about when we say traditional classroom? So is it a classroom where a professor stands at the front of the room and engages continually with students using the Socratic method? Is it a classroom where students work in small groups to accomplish discrete tasks with the help of an instructor and TAs? Is it the Houston neighborhoods where sociology students go out and collect their own data um, for our courses. I suspect that when the traditional classroom is used pejoratively, the speaker is usually picturing a classroom like this one where a professor might stand at the front for an hour and drone on while students are sort of frantically taking notes. Maybe that's what we're talking about. So I would be the first to agree that that method of teaching in many circumstances is probably not the most effective way to learn. But my point is that this framing of the traditional classroom as something that must be overcome is, I think, um, a little dramatic and probably one-sided. I also wonder who is doing the framing of this issue, and I think that's always an important thing as a sociologist to think about. So who stands to benefit if universities transition to expensive online environments? Um, I think we need to think about that. I would like to inject some uh, academic skepticism into this conversation, and I think my reputation for being a curmudgeon on these issues might be why I'm here. Um, I hope so, or else these remarks are a surprise. Um, so I will say I am really moved by the ways that edX and uh, ventures like Khan Academy, Khan Academy have opened up learning to the world. I think that is amazing, and I'm excited for Rice to be a part of that venture, no doubt. Um, I've enjoyed learning about my colleagues' efforts to put course material online, uh, to flip their classrooms and engage students in new ways. I incorporate a bunch of technologies into my courses. I'm not a complete Luddite. But I also believe very powerfully in the magic moment in a classroom between uh, teacher and student and student and student and all of us together learning about something as we unpack something challenging, for example, um, like white privilege or gender discrimination, I think there's a magic moment that happens when we're all together in a classroom that's really difficult to replicate online. So, um, so first I would like to start to answer like what is classroom for me in my project-based class. Some people could say that I flipped it. Also, it is another very general term like the traditional classroom. So. Uh, in this class, I ask my developmental psychology students to choose a topic as a class, and in the end of, instead of having a final paper or a, a final exam, the entire class makes a documentary on the selected topic. And um, everybody loves it, like it works great so far. And in this particular class, uh, I have three definitions for classroom. One is our like traditional teachings, and I will come to that. So it is the classroom itself. It is a classroom like this. There are bricks around, like we are sitting inside. Uh, so that is my first definition of classroom. My second definition of classroom is the moment they get out of the rice bubble, when they get off the campus, and they go and interview uh, experts, uh, like in the Houston area, local experts. And then the, my definition of classroom is the location where interviews take place. And there's a third definition. So students uh, work together to put this documentary, and in the end, they have a final product. Then we put it online. They all have access to it anytime they want. So that digital media component is my third definition of the classroom. And as I said, it, it works great. I love it. Students love it. Then you might ask me why I'm keep, keeping the traditional component uh, of this class. But as uh, Rachel already said, what do we mean by traditional classroom, right? So uh, I agree with most of the things Rachel say. I would like to back up, actually, the need for traditional classroom, that magic moment, by using some research. You know, in language research, we actually know that communication is not only verbal or written. 
gestures and mimics are uh, very important and there is plenty of um, research for that. Just to give like a very brief example, if you ask me, hey, Özge, where are you going? And if I say, oh, I'm going upstairs, doing this gesture, you would either think I'm lying or my English is not that good. <laughs> you would be skeptical of what I'm saying, right? So um, there is plenty of research uh, showing how people react to gestures and how they are the other communicative component. And I have reasons to believe that we actually use gestures and uh, mimics a lot in the traditional classroom. So all the professors here probably experience the moment they explain a concept and there are all blank faces, right? <laughs> No, Hopefully never, not. never. Never? No. It's only me then. <laughs> um, so when that happens, uh, so I go for the second shot, and, you know, my decision for going for the third shot actually is determined by how uh, students react, right? So, because, let's face this, if I ask students, is this clear, no student will say, no, professor, can you please explain <laughs> it again, right? But I have ways of uh, telling that, so I try to explain it, and if I hear sounds like, ah, in the class, <laughs> or really like convincing nods, uh, or like students taking notes, or like looking at each other and nodding, things like this, then I stop there, because I believe that most of them got it. Or like when I get not very confident nods, or like they talk to each other with these eyebrows and trying to understand what's going on. They are checking each other notes, so on and so forth. I think this list is really long and I can't even tell you what are the things I'm, I'm aware of when I'm in the traditional classroom. But uh, these things actually help me a lot to understand what they learn and what they don't learn. And uh, we all know that not every course we teach is the same. Semester to semester we have different uh, audience and this type of responses can change too. So I again believe in incorporating technology in my class. I have in-class exercises during my traditional section. We use technology, so on and so forth. But I think this portion I mentioned you, that face-to-face -face moment, that magic moment, or this like gestural moment, I think it would be very hard to see in a Google Hangout platform, for example, because you are not only looking at the student. Uh, herself or himself, but they're also looking at their interaction together. So this is one of the reasons why I keep the traditional component. Thank you very much. So last on our list is the dueling duo, Dennis and Joe. <laughs> and so the question that uh, I would ask them to address is how can we retain the best features of the traditional classroom, however you define it, while enhancing it with features from the classroom of the future? Okay, we'll try not to get to blows here while we're discussing this, so. <laughs> so let me give you a little bit of background. I'm the MOOC guy. So um, I first got involved in MOOCs in the fall of 2012 with the co some colleagues, Scott Rixner, John Greiner, Stephen Wong. We put together a class that appeared on Coursera. Excuse me, Joe, is the microphone on? I'm trying here, the green light's on. Closer? Okay. There's a green light that needs to come on. So. Um, we put together a MOOC on Coursera. It's kind of a traditional MOOC. It has videos, has machine-graded quizzes, it uses peer assessments. Um, it's something that can essentially run in kind of an automated way. So right now I teach in two very different kinds of classrooms, and I wanna kind of just briefly describe both of those so you get an idea of the extremes that are possible. So we use this material we've developed for Coursera to flip the Rice classroom. So students watch videos outside of classes, they do quizzes that basically require them to do the quiz before they come to class, so they've watched the videos. They do peer-graded assessments. They then come to class. I have 20 students. It's nice to have a small number. I have myself and two TAs. We run two 80-minute uh, sessions where we go over enrichment activities that basically move them beyond what's the material online. They work in groups. Um, we do lots of fun stuff. They get a chance for personal interaction with me. Um, if you think about that, that sounds like a pretty ideal Rice class. You've got lots of high-quality material. You get lots of personal interaction. What could you do better? So let me describe a second classroom, and this is kind of an extreme version. So right now we've just launched the fifth session of the MOOC. We have about, again, about 160,000 students enrolled. There are about 25,000 that are actively working on the class right now. So you might say, where's the classroom? We're clearly not having an auditorium, you know, with 160,000 people sitting there. It's mainly the class forums. So let me explain what a resource this is. So you're a student that doesn't understand the material. You're looking for that magic moment. You don't have an instructor there. You can post a question, and within 10 minutes, you'll have three to five responses. 
most of the people that respond are actually fairly knowledgeable and you will end up with a fairly high quality response very quickly. So what this gives you is the ability to get interaction with your peers, some of them very knowledgeable, very quickly. Let me contrast that with my RICE class. If you're working on an assignment, you get to meet with me twice a week. Um, if you're stuck and you're brave, and sometimes students aren't brave, you can send me an email. I'll check my email maybe every three hours. So you're talking about a three hour lag time to get information back from me on how to solve the problem. The second thing is what people pointed out, it's hard to get students to ask questions. When there's post every minute, it's very easy to anonymously post questions that allow you to say, oh, I don't understand this. Please, somebody help me understand it. There's a lot of discussion of magic moments here. And it's one of the things that I would point out is it's very hard to quantify what this magic moment is. And sometimes faculty have a tendency to think, I'm special, I'm doing something that's great here. And what I would challenge everybody to do is to think, okay, can you quantify what you're doing? And more importantly, can you replicate it? Um, I would claim that there's lots of magic moments that actually happen in our class, not because maybe they're higher quality, but because they happen much more frequently. You're free to ask questions and discuss things. And so my kind of take on this is that, for example, one thing that we could do easily that would improve instruction at Rice is to widen the community of learners. I've often thought about taking my Rice campus class and actually having it basically participate in the forums from the online class. So you can get the best of both worlds. You can get high quality instruction from me, but also have a community of 25,000 passionate learners that are working at the same time on the same thing that you're doing. So that's an example of where the ability to build collaborative spaces where we can all meet might be kind of a model for the classroom of the future. I'm more a curmudgeon <laughs> than anybody here, even than Rachel. And that Part of it has to do with the fact that I'm an old man and I've been teaching a long time and I sort of like the classroom I taught or classrooms I've taught in. I've never had to teach a class that was huge. I taught for years a class that was between 80 and 100 people, but I still did it by discussion. And when I talked to Joe about what might be something I could do, one of the things we talked about was the way in which when I grade papers, uh, there are a lot of things when the students don't write good papers, and I have plenty of students who write good papers, but I also have students who write absolutely dreadful papers. And what I do is that I, I talk to them uh, on paper, and then in a discussion that I have with them in, in a conference in my office about the strengths of what they said and the weaknesses of what they said, and then the weaknesses in their writing. And a lot of those weaknesses are, as Joe pointed out to me, things that could be done and put onto a computer so that the computer could read the paper and find things like too many sentences beginning with the subject, tense changes that are unmotivated, number errors, this without any noun following it, passive verbs, um, is constructions, cliches, slang, stuff like that. And it seems to me that that's at least a possibility I never thought about. And it would be something that I wouldn't have to do quite so much when I graded papers. But a lot of the problems with papers have to do with things like overgeneralizations and dangling participial phrases and lack of cohesion and awkwardness. And I doubt if a con computer could find those things. And all the rest of what happens in my classroom happens in a kind of face-to-face -face way. I try to learn about my students. I hand th four by six cards out on the first day of class and have them fill in things about themselves, where they went to high school, what they expect to do in 20 years, uh, what their extracurricular activities are, things like that. So I learn about them. And then when I conduct discussions, I tell them I'll call on them at random, so I watch faces. And I do <laughs> literally face to face. If a student is confused, I'll ask that student what confuses him. If the student looks like he's hiding or she's hiding from me, I call on that student. And I tell students that I'm gonna call on them at random, not because I'm a sadist, though maybe they'll think that by the time I'm through, but because I want them to participate actively and interactively in their own education. And that I tell them that I've read these books more than they have, but that I have no uh, absolute 
certainty about what I'm going to say, since there are lots of different ways of reading different books, and there are certainly things like wrong answers in text, um, not like text in physics, but text in, in, in English. If you're reading the first scene of Hamlet and you think the ghost isn't real, that's the wrong answer. If you're reading the third, fourth scene of the third act, that ghost could be real or not real. So they're there are certainties and then they're not certainties and they, they are open to do and reach for answers. And finally, I try to have them do work outside the classroom that's related to things inside the classroom. They write journal entries about the reading assignment, they enact scenes briefly in class and then at the end of the semester in my drama course, they have to act a scene 15 minutes long with at least one other person off book with costumes that they direct. They have to um, talk about when they, when they take my Shakespeare on film course, the last project is to make a movie on paper. So that what they're doing is using what we do in the classroom, studying film as well as Shakespeare plays, to then project act activities outside of the classroom, which they then bring into the classroom for me to look at. Thank you. Actually, let me follow yeah. up. We actually had a very nice discussion at the pavilion. We talked about this a lot. And so I think we finally came down to the conclusion this was really a biotechnology problem. Because what we really do is we need to clone me and basically take 30 years off of him. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> but what, what I would say is I, I was very impressed with his discussion of what he does in his class in terms of the amount of, you know, basically personal individualized instruction and labor that takes place in educating his students. But what I would point out is that you know, there's a substantial fraction of what you have in terms of expert knowledge of the particular endeavor and things that you do where you're doing the grading that I think you could, with the right support, actually automate to take maybe not 100% of what you could do in your class, but maybe 50% or 70%. And that has value because not everybody can be in your classroom. And you could go out and, for example, do things and let 10,000 people see the wondrous things that you can do. And even if they didn't learn all the skills for English composition that you could teach them in person, if they knew 50% of it, the world would be a much better place. Thank, thank you, panel. So we have, a, we have a little time. I'm wondering if uh, what got said by your fellow panelists uh, encouraged a question on your part. Um, and would a challenging question be useful? And that's certainly what we're going to want from the audience in a minute. Anybody have a, on our panel, have such a question of another panelist? I, I would just have a very brief observation that it seems across questions, uh, many of us are coming up with a, a similar um, constellation of tensions and opportunities, right? So uh, blending seems to be an emerging theme. How we might blend the optimal conditions of that, the scope are open for debate, but uh, I, I sense that through line across the six responses. Yeah, actually, I have a comment, and this is, I'll, I'll stir things up a little bit, because I heard the phrase magic, move, magic moment used by a couple of my colleagues here. And so if you read kind of editorials on online education and MOOCs and massive things, you'll often see the concept, well, I do something magic in my classroom, and there's no way this can be replicated online. And so my answer to you is, when you say things can never be done, I'm very skeptical. Okay. Um, technology is powerful. People are very ingenious. The rewards for doing this are much greater now because you can replicate this across not just one classroom but to millions of people. And so I would kind of turn this around. Don't think about maybe we can replicate it, but think about what can we do to simulate it? What can we do to extend it? How can we characterize it? Like, you know, for example, I, my response would be if you said I have a magic moment in my classroom, I'd say I have a thousand magic moments. We have an argument we really can't kind of quantify here. I would claim that because you have a thousand times more opportunities for interaction than you do in an in-person in 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 classroom, your chances of learning are actually greatly increased. So I don't think there's a right and wrong answer here, but I would say that the challenge to the community is to learn how to quantify these issues in a way that we can have you know, a scientific discussion about them. So does anybody want to react to Joe on this? Everybody agree? Well, I think he's talking to me. Yeah, yeah, no, I am. <laughs> um, and I hear you. But the concept of trying to quantify my magic moments just <laughs> drives me nuts. Um, but I, I, I get what you're saying. And I, I'm also thinking while you're talking, why would I want to replicate this for the masses? Like, what, what, is the, 
what's the motivation for doing that? I, that's hard for me to, it feels like that's sort of being thrown out there as like a given. Well, of course we should be doing this. And I'm not, I'm not there. Also, the concept of automating Dennis's grading English papers is very upsetting. Um, it didn't upset him. <laughs> no, man. See, this is why I'm more of a curmudgeon than, than, than Dennis. Well, I mean, we had a long discussion. We talked about, for example, you know, teaching English composition in high school and the difficulties of doing this. And maybe that, yeah, I think, maybe I'm miscarried. I hope I'm not miscarried. You said it was in a sad state. And it's from the fact that it's a very laborious process that it's just. And high school teachers teach too many cl classes, as you well know, Lisa. Ahead, so the, the point would be that, you know, you, you can't replicate Dennis, but if we could get 50% of him, the 50% that's maybe easy to replicate, that might do a world of good for high school students in there where they at least coming out, you know, understand, you know, I learned, I learned some stuff about English talking to him that I didn't know, so. <laughs> let, me, let me ask a question about flipping the classroom. Kathy, you've done some of both. I mean, you have some comparative, haven't maybe not data, yet. but. Haven't done, okay. haven't done the MOOC yet, so, you know, I, I yield to Joe on that. Uh, but for fully online, um, the Google Hangouts do allow you, you know, they're limited to 10 people, and you can watch each one, and people are, are, are speaking from their own space. They're comfortable in a way that, that's interesting. And my experience was they weren't afraid to ask questions, as opposed to the classroom where I feel like everybody's Nobody wants to step out and ask a question. And maybe it's because we were very careful to say, you know, please ask questions. That's what this is about. We want you to understand the material. But I say that in the classroom, too. And I find people have, you know, there are a few people who, you know, their hands goes up every time. But there are a lot of people that I know have questions that will never step up to offer that question. And that was easier for, for in that small group, because it is limited to 10, for them to do. I think we've all had that experience, I think. And in and, and Denny's course, you don't have any choice, right? They get called on. And as I recall you saying, after a while, then, then you, you, you don't brutalize them. I mean, you leave them alone. Brutal, brutalize, a nice word. I, <laughs> after about six weeks, if it's still clear that stu a student doesn't want to be called on, I leave him or her alone. But for the first six weeks of a class, I call on in my, in my two classes right now, which are small, they're 20 and 19, I call on virtually every student in every single class. So I think it's uh, time maybe to open it up and get questions. Is there a roving mic? I don't see a mic roving. Well, while, it, while you run a roving mic, I want to say one other thing, okay. and that's to Kathy, is I'm not sure you want them comfortable in a classroom. Thank that, you. Yes. That I want them... I want them alert, and I want them to be thinking hard and to be aware and to be ready. Now, years ago, many, many years ago, I tried law school, and it was not my bag. But I was tremendously impressed by the way they taught and the way they changed the cases after somebody had talked about a case and changed something in the case and then said, what does that happen? What then happens? And I felt that that was a tremendously important thing for me to do in a classroom was keep asking questions and slightly change them and get them concentrating so they aren't comfortable. I don't want them comfortable. I just want them to talk. <laughs> well, I can say firsthand I've been uncomfortable in a lot of classrooms, so uh, it seems like a good way to approach. So we have questions, but we do not have a mic. So please, uh, since some of us are quite old. Uh, if you wouldn't mind speaking up, please. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, I'm so impressed with all the comments that have been made. Uh, I was very grateful to Rachel's uh, uh, observation that uh, as there's a lot of talk about blending the new with the old, but for some reason uh, what is happening is a kind of uh, attack on the old that, that has gotten very popular, and that's not so good. Uh, I just wanted to add one thing, Ma you. maybe just two, and that is that the difference between Dennis Houston at 50% and Dennis Houston at 100% is not countable. <laughs> and I really 
I really think you have to experience that to know. For better or for worse. <laughs> <laughs> Understanding here that kind of the changes in all, with online education kind of encroaching are somehow meant to diminish kind of the in-person experience. What I envision is that in some sense we're free to choose the best path that enhances our abilities as a teacher. I don't want to see Dennis on campus doing anything less than 100%. But I think his ability to take 50% of them and actually project them out to folks that can benefit from them is actually quite important. It won't happen. <laughs> We need kind of a biotechnology thing. Right. Right? I will say another interesting experience having done online classes. You talk about kind of moments where you understand things. Let me, let me say that my experience in doing on-campus classes versus doing online classes is actually that it's tremendously enhanced my on-campus experience because the students online are actually more challenging. There's not this power structure where you're some kind of poor student getting greater. They're free to challenge any assumption that I make. There's thousands of them, so they're exploring all the places where you maybe you didn't pay 100% attention and you made a mistake in your material. And so what I found is that the material that's gone past the MOOC students actually enhances my on-campus material a lot. So I think the message to take is don't think of this as, an op as a kind of situation to fear, but an opportunity to exploit. And that Rice is a very small university by nature, and that this is a chance for us to go and leverage one of our strengths as teaching and actually extend our impact out into the world that kind of is much larger you know, than our size. And so, again, don't think about what you can't do. Think about what you can do. Think about how to take what's good and make it better. And I think that's the way I like to think about it. Thank you. We do now have a roaming microphone, but it's not here. So if you don't mind, let me start over here, and then I'll take your question. Oh, hi. Um, thank you to all the panelists. Uh, Caleb McDaniel in the History Department. One of the things that Professor Matthews said that really resonated with me is the idea that we should think about research into teaching and scholarship on teaching and learning. But it also seems to me that, um, you know, in recent years, the general thrust of scholarship on teaching and learning is to emphasize uh, how different learning is in different disciplines. You know, whether it's sort of writing across the disciplines or, um, you know, scholarship that's been done not on, on in my own field, uh, what it means to teach history is really not just a matter of teaching different content than in a computer science class, but it's also a matter of teaching a particular way of thinking and particular habits of thinking and, and argumentation. But it seems that when we have these conversations sort of about the classroom generally or, or technology generally or MOOCs generally, uh, we, we, 
we, there's sort of a counter movement against that scholarship because we're generalizing about teaching writ large without attention to those, those disciplinary differences that have been brought out in the literature. So I'm curious just from any of the panelists for comments on how we might inject our own disciplines and the difference between our disciplines into this um, broader conversation about teaching in classrooms. Thank you. Would you yeah, and pass the mic over here while we're getting comments from the panel. Please, anyone. So I'll make just a couple of responses. And Caleb, thank you. That's a terrific question on a couple of different fronts. Um, I think it's absolutely the case that there is some course content and some disciplines uh, that can make better use of this technology. It's a tool just like any other um, in our toolkit. And so I think we want to use it intelligently and experiment with it, but it it's not, um, I think, apparent that it is equally effective across disciplines or even within disciplines uh, across coursework at different levels or coursework that demands different things of students, right? Um, in terms of the question of research and what it might yield, I think that's a wonderfully important question. Uh, it, it's very early days still, and I think we would want the research to generate and respond to really probing questions about how students learn, as well as you know some of the more obvious questions we might ask about megatrends. But I really hear your um, observation that we don't want to homogenize the classroom or teaching or empty it of content and the variables thereof. And I think it's not either or. It's both and, and how you combine things and whether it's classroom, online, how, how you grade, whatever, uh, it's always going to be a decision that the instructor has to make about how does this fit into my disciplinary context and how much of this or that do I use? How much is it, is, is it important to be actually physically in the same space? And how much of this could be delivered effectively even, perhaps even more effectively in an online or other kind of, um, I guess online is, I'll make that very broad, online context. And so I, I think we tend to get into either or thinking. And I think it's important to do both and because the particular combination is going to vary across disciplines. Yeah, so I'm going to say actually very similar things to you. So I think first it is very subjective. It is really up to the instructor. Second, uh, like bringing together Caroline's and Joe's previous comments, I think first, like blending uh, seems to me really important. I think like we can take what we can put online and we can maybe like do some things about those, but there are certain components, if there are certain components that you don't want to give up, like I don't want to give up certain components of critical thinking that happens in classroom, then maybe like keeping those components in class and having hybrid classrooms rather than either or ones. To me, it seems to be the solution. So where's the, oh yes, here's the mic, thank you. <clears throat> so this is a fascinating discussion. I wanted to steer a little bit back towards the classical classroom. There are some research results that seem to show that smaller class sizes yield better results. You get better engagement with uh, an aggressive, active professor, and that's good. And there will always be a market for that. There's always going to be a parent willing to pay a premium for their child to go to a beautiful, august university and have that, that classical experience. My question for the panel is, how are we going to make that happen? Is that going to be our role? And in particular, how are we going to make the dollars work? You know, our computer science enrollments are growing, are so we're really impacted. There are problems in the humanities where we have underpaid adjuncts who are under-motivated because they're not paid enough to care, but they, they do anyway. How are we going to continue to fund and support and budget for and, and provide the classical experience? Or should we? So there is a range of questions there. Um, and I won't respond to all of them. I think we only have five minutes, less than five minutes left. Um, I, would, I would say in the context of Rice, uh, the experimentation with uh, MOOCs and, and Coursera and edX have been um, 
in some ways quite peripheral to our core academic mission, right? So we heard from Joe and Kathy about uh, some of the potential value adds in the Rice courses, but um, we aren't looking to uh, create a different campus reality that that eclipses the kind of quality education that Rachel described or Dennis described. So um, I think in, in the immediate future, uh, there is not a risk to the institution. Um, and the goals of, of the ambition from the start have been uh, to enhance the on-campus experience, right, in the way that Joe and Kathy and others spoke to today, um, while increasing uh, global access to that education, right? So I think those two ambitions continue to drive the efforts. Um, we're already seeing a number of students who are interested in Rice who wouldn't otherwise have known about what we do here. Um, it seems to me that these courses are tremendous, um, almost virtual tours of campus and of what goes on in our classroom in a way, and that they have a real um, benefit to us as an institution in that regard as well. Um, I could say more, but I'll uh, let others join in. I think this is also a both and issue. I think the reality is that the direct contact, and specifically the direct contact with scholarship and a scholarly approach to material, and a direct contact with research when you get into the to science and engineering is a really important component of what Rice offers as an education. And it is the premium that people pay to have access to that. That doesn't mean that, the, that information cannot be available more widely. And I think that's the both and aspect of having MOOCs that, that are able to reach out and bring information to a much broader segment of the population. And then we have our Rice experience. And to the degree that wit, to which Thinking about how you do this online and what does that mean and what is the research has, has changed what I do and I think I infer what Joe does in the classroom. It has been beneficial to Rice. And engaging Rice students in that process itself has been beneficial for them in understanding how this works and understanding their own discipline in a new way because they've had to think about it from the other side. Other questions? All the way to the back, Susan. Uh, we read 500 to 1,000 words a minute. We listen at about 100 words a minute. So why are we going to listening instead of reading? Because some of us learn better by hearing than by reading. But some of us don't. No, I'm, I'm not saying that everybody should learn that way. I'm just saying that some people are people who learn better from hearing other people talk and taking it in. I know I did when I was at school and still do. Okay. So uh, a couple of you brought up the idea of quantifying the learning experience. And so I feel fairly comfortable asking this question because I'm a psychologist, Simon Fisherbaum, uh, who studies memory and who has done some things that are somewhat related to this idea of um, how we might quantify the learning experience. Um, and one thing that comes up every time you do that is um, you end up making simplifications about um, what type of experiment you're doing. You look for memory for facts. You look for how well people can read a paragraph and then recite the facts that were already in that paragraph. And as we start to quantify the learning experience in a way that we can start to scientifically analyze it, um, it feels like we're learn losing some parts of what's critical about learning, what the things are that we should be doing in our classrooms. And so I was wondering how, as we move forward with this endeavor, which uh, I think is great and obviously should move forward, how we make sure that um, we don't get too stuck in the things that we can quantify while ignoring the things that are important to be teaching. Thank you. Comments? Maybe, uh, please. <laughs> Here, I, I will actually make a comment here. I'm the, I'm the moot guy, so let me just say a little bit about my first 23 years here. My first 23 years at Rice, I fancied myself as a, as a reasonable classroom professor. And I never thought about things as complicated as rubrics or what my students are learning. I just kind of taught people the way I learned, which was in a very ad hoc way from my mentor who taught me. And so what I've noticed is when I run a class with 100,000 people, 
I see a much deeper kind of range of possibilities. I get a much, even just the seat of the pants, better understanding of kind of what's difficult and what's hard. But most importantly, I see possibilities. If I have a class with 100,000 people, I can run 10 sections of 10,000 and vary the parameters of the experiment with each section and try to measure what's going on in terms of that. Now, you, your question is, what should we measure? And I don't know the answer to that. But what I would point out is the fact that because the classes now have a significant portion of it that's recorded where we can run it again, we can become more rigorous about what we're trying to test. I don't know the answer to your question, but what I would say is that I think doing this in a more scientific way is possible. And so I'm not claiming that doing it online is going to be better than in class, but I would say is by doing it online where a significant portion is recorded, you can kind of play the experiment multiple times and actually very small parameters and try to understand their impact. So I feel like there's an opportunity to attack that question in a more scientific manner. I have maybe one possible answer to your question, like one way of quantifying that wouldn't be the content of the interaction. I definitely agree with you, we would lose a lot of stuff. One way of looking of it would be looking at what type of students respond on an online forum versus in class. This is something, this is not my idea, this is actually something we talked together, and we had lunch together. So, um, do different uh, students uh, reply to your questions, like different profile, different ethnic back background, different socioeconomic background, in classroom versus like different gender, in classroom versus forums? I think first the number of students who reply in either platform, and then the profile of the students that reply in either p platform, I think that could be useful information. But I agree with you about the content. I don't think we have any way to be able to quantify the content of the interaction of let, Rachel's magical moments. Let, let me ask you a show of hands again so Susan can find you with a mic. So let's start back here and then we'll come forward. Um, okay, so I, just to sort of play devil's advocate, I think we should try to quantify what a magic moment is. And the, re the reason is that I think it has to do with a change that's occurring in a student at a particular moment in time. And change is actually something that is easy to measure. But you have to figure out, what is that change? Is it a change in attitude? Did that student go from somebody who was just taking your class because it was a requirement to somebody who's going to major in that? Um, anyway, I just think it's kind of interesting to try to figure out what are those magic moments, what is the quantification of that, and and try to measure it. And to the point of looking at who responds online, I actually think that's really important and figuring out you know, if certain kinds of students respond better, is there something else that should be done in online to, to meet the needs of all students? Anyway, but okay, I just so want to play devil's advocate on the magic moment. We'll have a couple more questions, but are there comments from the panel? Just, just quickly, like, I mean, <laughs> yes. Okay, I, I think that you could, perhaps you could do it, I just don't want to spend my time doing that. I would rather spend my time in the classroom with my students watching those moments happen and helping to cultivate them. If other people would like to measure my magic moments, you are more than welcome to come to my class. <laughs> Please. Um, so one note of skepticism that I have sitting on the sidelines watching people prepare MOOCs or, or digital education efforts is that it takes a ton of time, an enormous amount of time but then I've thought, well, that's an investment early on. And then what is going to be, in your case, Joe, or your mm -hmm. case, Kathy, what's going to be your course in five to 10 years? How cooked is it going to be? How much work is it going to be in the five to 10 years out? Like, there's a lot of work to get it <laughs> off the ground. But what happens then? What happens to the life of the course that you're creating? OK, so the department chair for CS is not here, is he? OK, so I'll just say this. In, in my fantasy mind, you could imagine the following. He comes in and says, I'm sorry, Joe. You're just not being predictive. We're going to increase your teaching load. So my response is, OK, I'll push this button over here, too. So that'll be my, my three classes I'm going to teach. I'm just going to push three buttons, and it's all done because it's in the can. So the, the point is, it's tremendous investment up front. The, the amount of work that I do per class now is still it's, it's, it's modest. But the, the thing that happens is if you want your class to stay current, you've got to put effort into it. It's not a static thing. Every session we offer for this class, we make significant revisions. And that's based on the fact that we can observe what happened in previous classes. This particular time, we've introduced a new tool that helps people understand how programs work. The thing that you have to understand is that, that because MOOCs have a global scope, there's competition taking place. If my MOOC is bad, 
Somebody will build a MOOC that will displace it. It's MIT has a good class. I want to have a class better than MIT. I don't know how to quantify that. But it's not going to be something where I'm going to sit back and say, hey, OK, I've made my great class. I'm going to just li live on my laurel, rest on my laurels for the next 20 years doing it. Because what will happen is there are other classes that people are building that will have better approaches and be more effective and be more popular. And those will force me to respond as a result. So I think it's something that it will make me a better teacher. But I don't know that I'll necessarily turn it into something where I can just press a button and say, my job is done now, and I'm just going to you know, take it easy for the next few years. And, and we all know that happens in classrooms, too. People just stop doing any preparation. OK, so, so who's got the mic? Susan does. Deborah has a question, and Bob Curl has a question. And then we could probably take one more, and then we're going to go drink or whatever. <laughs> I wanted to, um, I want to preface this by saying that I, I think the MOOCs are incredible and, and that there is a huge need and that our universities have, have gotten so expensive, not everybody can get educated. And uh, I just have so much respect for what's going on and I hope to do one myself at some point. Uh, but I also wanted to answer a little bit the question of our psychologist asked, what is lost? And I think that one of the things is lo that's lost is all those moments when we make mistakes. Uh, the fact that, <clears throat> I think it was John Dewey, who's one of the great philosophers about education, and what he said was that we don't teach our subject. We teach who we are. And um, when we are in front of a classroom and making a mistake, seeing something the wrong way, and having the student uh, point that out and having to talk about why we made that mistake will no longer happen in a MOOC because it is so um, uh, nicely, uh, I mean, it's, it's a little bit of like the difference between a play and a film where you can re <laughs> redo it and, and make it great. Um, so I do, uh, um, uh, I think someone over here asked a great question that was not really answered. How can we hold on to both of these pro approaches? How can we build the MOOCs, which I think is extremely important, and not lose something that uh, is, is, is really valuable? And uh, I, I do think that if you're like me, you've heard lots of colleagues say that a decade from now, our universities won't look like this anymore, and that two or three decades uh, from now, they won't be here. And uh, so I do think it's something to think about. And neither will some of us. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of us. Panel, panel, panel comments? Yeah, let me, let me make a comment here. I think the, the premise that somehow students don't get to kind of experience and benefit from their mistakes in an online class, I, I, I don't agree with that premise. My students make a ton of mistakes. And I talked about how active the forums are. People are posting questions all the time about, wow, I don't understand this problem. I've got this thing. What's wrong? The difference is I'm not correcting it. Their peers are correcting them. And I also have a very large collection of community TAs that help out on that. In fact, I often make the joke that I'm the world's best expert on how not to program in Python because you see so many mistakes that are exhibited in the forums in terms of what people see. And so I think that's a thing that where I think that, you know, you still see that in there. I think that there's many things that could be done to basically improve MOOCs. And for example, how to amplify what I'm doing so I can reach out to students in a more personal way. Right now, it basically MOOCs are peer to peer. On Rice, it's expert to student. And so I think that there's a whole range of this. And how can we take both of those and blend those in a way where we get the best of both? Again, it's, you, you worried about in 10 years, it's going to be totally different. That may be true, but I think it'll be totally better. I mean, nobody is going to have their arm twisted and say, hey, Dennis, you know what? Guess what? It's time to build a MOOC. You're going to have to put everything on videotape. It's not going to happen. I mean, I think the faculty are, <laughs> I think the faculty are stubborn enough. That, but the key is you've got options. You have different things you can do. And that when people make a MOOC, I, well, for example, they ask, how should you do video? My answer is do what you think you do best. Okay, if you want to work at a chalkboard, work at a chalkboard. If you want to sit behind a webcam, do a webcam. If you want to talk to a live audience and record, do that. The key is you have a many options now to how to improve the educational experience. Susan Bob Deborah, Curl, can you bring uh, it down? Deborah, could I just follow up? Deborah? Yes. Uh, and oh, I just. I'm sorry, Carolyn. <laughs> 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 uh, 
I would just say briefly, I think your analogy of a play and a movie is really apt. And just as uh, someone taking Joe's MOOC for a nominal amount of money, if, if anything at all, wouldn't expect the same experience that a matriculated Rice student would take in his per credit course, um, you know, I think, I think that's not a bad thing, right? I don't think the ambition is to reproduce in toto the on-campus experience at the level of MOOC. solution of that is really going to depend on the faculty. I mean, our faculty here and other universities, that's one thing Chuck Vest said about the initiative that came to him is the best ideas usually come from the faculty, not top down. Unfortunately, not all universities sort of have that experience, but it certainly, history shows that's correct. Bob Curl. Okay. Uh, I sort of wanted to question the premise of all this. Uh, that is, what really you're talking about is learning, not teaching, okay? And so, what is the role of the teacher in learning? And so, it, it's, I sort of, my world is divided into two parts. One part is my soul, my, my aesthetics. The other part is my profession, what, you know, what, I, what I'm interested in research. And those are two very different things that I want to learn in, in terms of what I want to learn. In terms of my profession, what I, would, what I always relied on my teachers for was to tell me what it was important to learn and give me some a way to approach learning it. Uh, and the, that's a very difficult question because there's, in my professional world, there are enormous a number of tools and possibilities and I have to figure out do I want to spend my time learning about something which may not turn out to be ever useful in my profession? On the other hand, if I don't know about this tool, it might be that I've slipped up and it could be incredibly useful. And so there's always this tremendous tension. You can't learn everything. What should you choose to learn? Teachers are very helpful in telling you what's really important to learn. And on the other side, it's much more open in, in terms of, of what one would do for their soul, what one would do for their aesthetics. Uh, and there, uh, I think it's more of an, kind of an argument with the teacher about what's really important in, in that area. So I don't know what I'm adding to this conversation other than, than it seems to me that, that the focus on teaching is not putting the role of the teacher in the right place, I guess. Are there, are there comments from the panel on Bob's point? I will actually make a comment. I think that I had a, have a conversation with a high university administrator who was discussing kind of the role of MOOCs in there. And we had a long discussion about kind of, you know, how MOOCs were built and on-campus education. And he made the comment, he said, I've heard more discussion of rubrics in the last six months than I've heard in my entire time here at the university. And so what happens is that I think because MOOCs are threatening, they're a possible profit center, they're a way to shake up the order, they provide a greater emphasis on thinking about how are we teaching, what are we doing? And so for me, I mean, again, I'll just be honest. I, for 23 years, I focused on research. I did a reasonable job in teaching. <clears throat> for the last two years, I put my full effort into trying to be the best teacher that I can be. And for me, that was transformative. And part of the reason I did this is because of the reward experience. Why am I on this panel? It's because I built a very nice MOOC. And so I think there's a, the, the reward system may change somewhat where there's incentives for faculty to go out and say, hey, you know what, if you do a great job, there's places you can take what you've done beyond the classroom here and go out and give it to the external world. And there are things that come back to the university as a result. Carolyn. Bob, that's a terrific question and a great distinction. And I would merely say from the perspective of someone looking or scanning the Coursera website or the edX website, um, you know, it's a collection of classes. Uh, there aren't advisors telling you what you need for your major or what progress to make through this rapidly expanding 
curricula. Um, you know, the, the founders of edX and Coursera both want as many courses as, as possible quite quickly, um, but there aren't the kind of advising, mentoring uh, components built into making sense of that growing corpus. And I think that's a key thing to remember as well. There are specializations that are starting to emerge three or four courses in a row, but that's really the extent of it. So I think the last question, Rich. Oh my. <laughs> it, it's better be profound. Yeah, it better be good, huh? Yeah, <laughs> wow. Let's go drink. <laughs> well, I just wanted to say that uh, periodically in this uh, discussion that's been largely anecdotal, the issue of, of research has come up. And I think that part of the problem and, and much of the resistance uh, that occurs on sort of old school teachers, on the part of old school teachers, that they really don't understand the research and they're not, they don't have access to that research. And one of the really important um, institutions that we have here now at Rice is the Center for Teaching Excellence. And of course, Kathy has, has played a major role in this and Josh, uh, as the head of this operation, is, is a person who's a source of this kind of information. And just even in conversation, he's, uh, I, I asked him one time, you know, what is the most important thing that you've discovered in research over education in the last decade? And he said, not to talk over 15 minutes at a time. And I think it's a wonderfully insightful thing uh, to say about teaching. And I think if we, if we avail of those kinds of resources like the center and Josh and so forth, we can learn more about the research that informs these various perspectives and we'll, we'll be the better for it. I just want to say Steve Cox has, has been the director. I only stepped in to replace him while he was on sabbatical. He's back and is now the director again. He's back. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. And it's been a wonderful panel. Thank you very much. And I would.